Um, I'll try to make it quick and, uh, and keep it light here. I have the same disclosures as before. I'm um, just a review, and, and my biggest disclosure is this is my favorite topic. Um, this, this, is, this is my passion in life, trying to um, encourage timely referrals. So I'm going to try not to do this and try to do more of this, be, a, <laughs> be an encouraging. Um, so we all know that, that heart failure is a, a, a big problem. It's the number one discharge diagnosis among Medicare beneficiaries. Um, the, the hospital discharges for heart failure incidence prevalence is rising in the United States. Um, the projected increase of heart failure over uh, you know, a two-decade span is 25%, but the increase in cost of taking care of all of these patients with heart failure is 215%. So it's a, it's a huge problem, very expensive, and also a very deadly problem. And you can tell, unlike the heat map, which I didn't include for coronary disease, which is mostly um, in the southeast, you know, the stroke belt, heart attack, heart attack belt, Heart failure is a problem across the country. Um, it's, it's, the, it's a very deadly disease. We know there are several therapies for heart failure that we can use, and, and we've talked about a lot of them, you know, and I'm not going to belabor this. Everybody knows that you should put it, pay patients on an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker and spironolactone, get a defibrillator, AFib ablation, all these things that we can do, right? Um, and the goal of this is to reverse remodel, and, and I promise this is the only pressure volume loop in my talk. <laughs> but um, our goal is to get patients um, from, you know, from over here on the pressure volume curve back to a, a, a normal loop. But do you ever feel like you're doing this in clinic with these patients? You know, you're you know, trying to go up on the beta blocker and, and cutting down on the ACE inhibitor and, you know, stopping something, starting something, and constantly changing. We're just, at this point, rearranging deck chairs, right? Um, so sometimes, you know, maybe we can use these as flotation devices. But the, the goal of my talk is to try to discourage this. And I think the real question is um, not, you know, who's at risk. We know who's at risk, and, and we try to treat them appropriately in clinic, and I think we do such a great job of that now, um, making sure all diabetics are on an aspirin and, and, you know, an ACE inhibitor and a lot of these things that we've really stressed to the primary care docs, but um, trying to figure out this C to D stage and, and who are these people, I think this is where we fail. Um, this is a, a real struggle. And there are some guidelines. This is a very busy slide, uh, but it's in, in your um, syllabus if you want to review it that describe sort of the different stages and, and, and when to refer. But truly, you know, I just sort of think of it this way. Um, and the red can illustrate time spent in clinic um, or, you know, sort of the, um, the, the problem areas for these patients. And, and obviously, a new diagnosis transition phase is a very high risk time. And some of these patients never get out of the transition phase. Um, this could be a post-STEMI patient who just never recovers, leaves on milvernone, and then gets um, evaluated for VAD shortly thereafter, um, you know, or a, a patient with postpartum cardiomyopathy, et cetera. But most patients do go on to have a plateau phase. Uh, they may be in the clinic for a period of years, doing fine, following up, getting their ICD checked every three months, um, you know, seemingly doing okay, but at some point um, things sort of start to get worse, and I think the, the real trick is trying to figure that out, you know, here on the curve and not here on the curve. Um, so uh, one question, and we can do an audience response, which diagnosis carries the highest mortality at six months? Who thinks it is ALS? Who thinks it is advanced heart failure? Excellent. All right. Well, yes, <laughs> you're very smart. You know, it's a uh, <laughs> heart failure talk. Um, good guess, but yes. Um, so, you know, I think this is really important to recognize because these patients are sitting in our clinic not looking very sick, and they may not even be recognized, and they're on an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, and they're sitting in clinic, and their uh, prognosis is horrible. And it's important not only to refer them timely, but also to um, have these conversations with patients so that they can plan. 
You know, if somebody told me that I had stage four lung cancer, I would know exactly what that meant. And I would know, um, you know, that I want to go to the beach with my family one last time, that I want to do things, you know, differently in my life. But our patients with heart failure, they don't appreciate that when their doctor tells them that they have advanced heart failure. So um, it's, it's kind of a challenge of when to refer. You don't want to refer when somebody's too well, make them you know, travel a long distance to go see a heart failure doc. You don't want to refer when they're too sick because then we can't do anything for them. So when is this optimal cutoff time? Well, uh, the ESC has some criteria, and obviously anybody with class three or four symptoms, that's pretty broad. That's my entire clinic. Um, Clinical signs of fluid retention or hypoperfusion, that can be you know, challenging to tease out, especially if you don't treat heart failure every day. Um, anybody with the objective evidence of severe LV dysfunction, and I would say anybody with a very dilated LV should, you know, over six centimeters, they should be seen in an advanced heart failure clinic. That's a, not a good prognostic sign, and the chance that they will develop advanced heart failure is pretty good. Um, anybody with a severe reduction in exercise capacity, anybody with more than one hospitalization in the past six months, um, and the presence of any of the above despite optimal medical management. And um, I've sort of highlighted reduction in exercise capacity because uh, this can be tested with a cardiopulmonary exercise stress test, and I think that's one tool that we don't use enough, um, and, and especially for referring docs, you know, that's one way to objectively get some information about your patient and sort of let you know when, it, you know, are they sick enough that they need to be referred. Some additional criteria from the United States, anybody with frequent ICD shocks, um, that's, a, that's not a good sign. So, um, hyponatremia. Um, anybody who's been going to the emergency room or the hospital, again, um, uh, cardiac cachexia, um, if you're needing additional diuretics in clinic, um, whenever I see somebody on high doses of torsamide, the wheels start turning in my head, you know, maybe things are getting worse and we need to sort of evaluate them for advanced therapies. You know, they're on 100 of torsamide twice a day with a booster diuretic. Gosh, things aren't going well. Um, and, and importantly, anybody who can't tolerate an ACE inhibitor or a beta blocker because their creatinine is rising or they're hypotensive, uh, that's, that's a sign of worsening heart failure. You know, they're not just lazy or not, you know, handling it well. Um, they're actually getting sicker, and we need to think about that. Heart failure hospitalization is incredibly ominous. Uh, we need to, to recognize this. You know, in, in our hospital, the hospitalists admit most of our heart failure patients, um, and I think it's very unappreciated how sick these patients are and how poor their prognosis is. So we have actually started an inpatient heart failure unit, um, an integrated practice unit, um, where we try to capture all these folks and sort of bring them into our venues so that we can evaluate people and catch them sooner. Uh, but you can see here that a patient who's been hospitalized three times in a year, and this is not uncommon. I'm sure we all see patients like this all the time, and we talk to them about sodium and give them some Lasix and um, tell them not to eat Doritos anymore, and we send them home, right? Um, that patient's prognosis is terrible. You know, this is median survival. That's a year. Uh, so, so, so we need to recognize that it wasn't the Doritos um, or the pizza or maybe even the chicken fingers or wings or whatever, that, that maybe it's the heart just getting worse. And importantly, we can dramatically improve their outcomes. So this is uh, medical therapy. This is doing nothing, right, or, or inotropes or... Um, you know, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, medical therapy. Um, and, and we can dramatically improve it with advanced therapies for heart failure. Uh, I know a lot of people trained back in the era where uh, VADs and transplants were, were you know, very onerous. <laughs> and they still are. Nothing, not a whole lot has changed, but we can dramatically improve survival. You can see here in the original VAD trials, survival at, at two years was about 50%. And in the recent trials, uh, which I'll go over in a minute, um, survival has improved dramatically. And obviously with a heart transplant at two years, around 83, 84% of patients are alive, uh, which is a dramatic improvement and, and means a lot to patients. 
Unfortunately, a transplant's not a viable option for a lot of people because it's a very limited resource. You know, we do about two to 3,000 transplants in our country every year, which isn't very many. You know, they estimate about 200 to 250,000 patients would benefit from a transplant, depending on how you define it. So not a lot of people who need one are able to get one, mostly because of age and other comorbidities, uh, and, and some people because of their blood type and other anti antibody factors. So we can also think about palliative care with, with inotropes, and we do a lot of inotropes trying to improve quality of life and trying to, to help people um, lead a better life for the time that they have left. But this is, a, this is not a to help people live longer, and I think that's very important to recognize. You know, milrinone helps you feel great, and, and people, you know, wake up the next day after you start it, and, you know, they feel, feel as though they're cured, and they're so happy, and, and um, but importantly, you know, the, the, in the, especially in the rematch trial, which was one of the original VAD trials, um, you can see that we definitively uh, concluded that this is not a good therapy in terms of living longer. So now we have the left ventricular assist device, and, and um, I'm sure many of you have some experience with this. Uh, that we had, right now, we have two different types of devices. One is a mechanical bearing axial flow pump. And, the, um, and then there are a couple different devices that are magnetically levitated, uh, continuous flow pumps that are intrapericardial. And, um, and they're sort of designed to help prevent pump thrombosis and um, have intrinsic pulsatility, which we think is gonna help and hopefully prevent more GI bleeding, which is one of the major side effects of VAD. Outcomes are improving dramatically with LVAD2. Um, some of the recent trials and Momentum 3 with the HeartMate 3 showed that survival can be as high as 83% at two years. And we don't have a, a good, pretty graph for that. It's not been released yet, but um, you can see in, in this data too that survival is, is significantly improved. And if you remember um, the heart transplant data, survival around 84% percent at two years, VAD is almost there. So, so we're, we're doing much better. You know, it, it's, uh, people are living a lot longer and, um, and it's, a, it's a much better therapy than it used to be. And very importantly, quality of life is significantly improved with the VAD. You know, we think of these people as being in the hospital all the time from fellowship and, you know, that was sort of everybody's experience. But uh, when you're a heart failure doc and you see these people in the clinic, uh, they have a significantly improved quality of life. And, and most of these patients tell me, um, and in fact, in the trials, they, they told the trial investigators, 80% said that they would, uh, that they have, a, they like their life better now with the VAD than before, that they would rather deal with the batteries and the hospitalizations for bleeding and other complications than be tired and short of breath all the time and not able to do anything. Um, so I think this is the number one reason to um, try to refer your patients, especially the, the elderly DT VAD patients. So the way that we as heart failure docs describe how sick you are with advanced heart failure or in terms of VAD is with the Intermax profile. And the Intermax is our VAD registry. And everybody who gets a VAD is, is plugged into this registry and we can do a lot of um, interesting studies with it. But there are, are seven levels. Level one is the sickest patient. These, we, we refer to this as the crash and burn. These are patients um, who are in the ICU with a balloon pump, several drips, maybe on the ventilator. They're very, very sick to level seven, which is sort of a class 3B, uh, a patient who is, is sick, not feeling well in clinic, lethargic, but um, they're, they're not sick enough quite yet. And this has an important implications for outcomes, and this comes to when to refer, right? So you can see here in, in group one, the um, survival is not very good. These are our crash and burn patients, and um, you know, survival at 36 months was about 50%. So not super great. And not surprisingly, I mean, how well are you supposed to do when you go to the operating room uh, on a balloon pump and, and three pressors and two inotropes and on the ventilator? And that's not the best setup for any surgeon, even a heart failure surgeon. Um, and our, our group two, which are the sort of next level down, also they did better, but still not as well as um, the, the group three, who are the 
the Intermax 4, 4, 4 through 7, who are patients who are caught just as they sort of move into the advanced heart failure arena. And I think, importantly, it takes a village to evaluate for a VAD um, or a transplant, and it takes time. These things don't happen overnight. There's a lot of things that have to happen before you get a durable VAD implanted or um, even more so if you get listed for transplant. We need, you know, I tell people we need several weeks, truly, to, if, if not months, to get some of these things sorted out. Patients frequently need colonoscopies, they need a dental visit, you know, they have, you know, there's some spot on the lung that comes up and we've got to investigate that and look into it and, oh, why are their platelets so low? Well, let's get hematology involved. Now they need a bone marrow. But, you know, things come up and it, and it takes a long time to get these patients evaluated. So uh, when they're in the ICU incredibly sick, um, not only are they not going to do as well, but they may not have the opportunity to even be evaluated. So I just want to go over a case story. And this is a, a case that I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with. Um, this patient is a 52-year-old man, and he's admitted with shortness of breath. Uh, his echo shows that his ejection fraction is 30%. He has a left heart cath after discharge, and that demonstrates minimal coronary disease. He started it on beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor by his cardiologist. A couple months later, his ejection fraction hasn't improved, so he has an defibrillator placed for primary prevention. A few months after that, he requests disability due to ongoing fatigue. And then he's admitted for heart failure. He's diuresed. He's counseled on his diet. His beta blocker is decreased because he's fatigued and not feeling well. His ICD fires, and he's admitted. His potassium and magnesium were normal. He has a left heart cath again, looking for ischemia, and it shows minimal plaque. Later that month, later that year, his ACE inhibitor is stopped in clinic due to worsening renal function and fatigue and low blood pressure. And then the next year, he's admitted for heart failure again. Uh, milrinone is used while he's there to assist with diuresis because his kidney function isn't very good. He comes off of the inotropes before he's discharged, though, so that just used for a couple days, and he's sent back home. And then later that year, he's admitted with cardiogenic shock. He's intubated. A uh, balloon pump is placed. Multiple pressors are started. And a heart failure consult is called. Um, evaluation by our heart failure team shows that his cardiac index is 1.2, which is incredibly low. He has fixed pulmonary hypertension with a transpulmonary gradient of 22. So this takes him out of the running for a transplant at this point. Um, his liver is cirrhotic from passive congestion, and his creatinine is 2.2. Is He's in um, acute on chronic renal failure. So, um, you know, unfortunately, his situation continued to deteriorate, and a palliative care consult was called. So I think, you know, the question is, um, we all recognize him as having advanced heart failure at this point, right? He's, you know, in the, in the, in the ICU, crashing and burning. He is an Intermax 1. And we know that the outcomes are very poor for advanced therapies at that point. And I guess the question is, when should we have referred this guy? So I would have referred him at this point when he requested disability because of fatigue. Uh, that would have caused me to have a lot of concern that he was so fatigued that he felt like he couldn't do ordinary activities during his day. I think we don't have to refer every single patient with heart failure. Sometimes people come in and they're on a, you know, a, a guideline directed medical therapy, doing great, continuing to work, and they're doing fine, and that's okay. Uh, but if somebody is very fatigued and they, they can't do their ordinary activities, and what I ask in clinic is, are you able to get dressed without having to stop and rest? Can you take a shower? Can you work? Um, you know, some people are running three miles, and you don't even have to ask those questions, but, but most people, if you start to tease things out, you start to get a picture of exactly how poorly they're doing. And, and if we didn't refer him then, we certainly should have referred him when he was admitted for heart failure, because we, we went over the uh, mortality rates after admission for heart failure, and then when his kidney function got worse, and, and when his ACE inhibitor had to be stopped, I think that was also a telling moment. So hopefully that was a, a, a telling tale for you. Um, and in conclusion, you know, advanced heart failure is very common. It's increasing in prevalence, as is all heart failure, and it's associated with an incredibly high mortality rate. 
There are certain characteristics that can be used to identify patients failing ophthalmological therapy and who may benefit from VAD or transplant. And appropriate timing and selection remains key to optimizing outcomes for these people. So thank you. <laughs>